Carpet was in his room and I came up and we started off by showing him the drawings of the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. And one by one by one, Prabhupada was commenting and rejecting them for various reasons. Prabhupada liked the original drawings as simple as they were that had been done by Govinda Dasi and Gorsundar. These drawings, while technically, I think, superior, lacked in so many ways, according to Srila Prabhupada. In one drawing, the Goswamis, Rupa and Sanatan, were absent. In another drawing, one of the Goswamis was sitting on the same level as Lord Chaitanya. I mean, on and on, Prabhupada would tear apart these drawings. And as he kept going through them, he was getting angry. Now, I don't know if any devotee had ever seen Srila Prabhupada angry before. I certainly had not. So it was, it was a shock and it was scary and it was... I was very frightened. <laughs> and... It, the conclusion was we weren't going to use any of those drawings. So then I had to now bring out the Krishna book and start to show Prabhupada the paintings that the artists wanted to take out and the press devotees wanted to take out and the new ones that they wanted to insert. So I introduced the topic and Prabhupada said, they want to add paintings? I said, no, Srila Prabhupada, they want to replace paintings, not add. In some cases, they are the same scene, they think they painted it better. In other cases, they want to replace, they want to take out paintings that they think were painted too long ago and they're not painted in a serious way and insert other paintings, not of the same Leela, but just because they're technique, technically better. Prabhupada said, what? You have no authority to do that. You have no authority here. Once a painting has been approved, you can't remove it. If you want to repaint that pastime, and if the new painting is better, shows more detail, shows more Leela, more character, uh, that might be considered. But just to take one painting out, to put a different one in, no, you cannot do that. He said, once I have approved something in my books, it is eternal. Once a painting is approved, it is eternal. You have no authority. I said, oh, okay. So I said, do, do you want me to show you what they're proposing? And very unhappily, he said, okay. <laughs> so I started to show Srila Prabhupada the paintings, one by one, that they wanted to insert. One of them was a painting of Krishna killing Putana. Now we had a painting of Krishna killing Putana, so this, I think, would have fit the category of we're taking an old one out and putting in a better one. Prabhupada looked at it. He made a face. And Prabhupada said, that is an ugly black mass. That is not superior. Rejected. Okay. And on and on, I showed Prabhupada a painting of Krishna sitting on the rocks, which I thought was beautiful. Prabhupada thought his hair was too long and wild. Rejected. And besides, you want to take, you don't want to add, you want to take out a painting that I have already approved for that? No, rejected. And as I kept showing Srila Prabhupada these paintings, the anger that had started with the line drawings for TLC had grown to almost like roaring proportions. At one point he was pounding his fist on the desk saying, this is what I'm afraid of, that you will make changes in my books that will ruin them. No, you have to get permission. You cannot do this. So finally, I had one last painting to show Srila Prabhupada. I said, Prabhupada, they want to take out the painting of the Ras Lila and insert this new painting of the Ras Lila that appeared in the third canto. Prabhupada didn't say a word for a moment. From his sitting room, he can look into his bedroom where he sees this beautiful painting of the original Ras Lila that Devahuti did hanging on his wall. So he's looking at that painting 
Then he looks back at the print of the painting that I wanted, to, that we wanted to put in his book. I said, you think this is better? This is a hippie dance. Their heads are not covered. Krishna's hair is wild. The gopi's hair is wild. Hippie seeds. Hippie dance. Rascals. They're all rascals. Prabhupada was so angry. He was banging his fist and yelling at me. At that time, his servant Sudama uh, came running in because he heard the yelling. He couldn't imagine what it was. He opens the door. He sees Prabhupada like Nishringadev. He couldn't even get down to offer his obeisances. He was so terrified. He stood in the doorway. On one foot, he lifted himself up with his other foot and covered his eyes. He couldn't bear to see the scene. And then Prabhupada said to me, get out. And he threw us both out. It was the first of many lessons that Prabhupada gave me about making changes in his books. When he would talk about Krishna, I would temporarily forget who I was, where I was, and what I was doing. I would just be wrapped. And then when he would stop talking, I would be like, oh yeah, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm here, I'm, my name is uh, such and such. And we all had that experience, I think, I think you know what I mean. His words, his ability to bring transcendental sound into this material creation was his greatest gift. He was able to connect us with the spiritual world by that communication. And that communication went into his books. He didn't write his books, he spoke his books. Every morning he would get up at two in the morning, sometimes earlier, and he would sit at the dictaphone and he would speak. He would speak into the microphone and you'd hear the little clicking sound. And sometimes I would sit outside the door, but I would sometimes sit outside and listen to him translating his books. And I would peek in, and it was like another world was going on. There was another dimension, an alternate reality that was existing in, around him that I didn't see with these eyes, but that I could feel. And we all glimpsed it, whether we glimpsed it one time or more than one time, we all glimpsed it. One time in Boston, we had these big keyholes, you know, those old-fashioned keyholes. And I used to, uh, I didn't want to bother him, so I would peek in the keyhole to see if he needed anything. I could usually tell if he needed water, if he needed something, so I would just peek in the keyhole. And I remember one time, I had this overwhelming experience, you know, like Mother Yashoda looking into Krishna's mouth or something like that, you know? Peeked in the keyhole, and he was sitting, and with the Bhagavatam open, singing, singing the verses, and just dramatically uh, chanting and talking, and, and I, for a few moments, I realized he's not alone in there. Um, there's demigods or there's beings I can't see. And I remember going, wow, I'm living in this house. i cooking the meals and cleaning the floors and doing the laundry, but I haven't got a clue who he really is. I remember telling Satsarup, we don't know who he is. We have no idea who he is. And I think that that's something we really need to revive in our ISKCON movement, is who Srila Prabhupada really is, the divinity that he really is, the, the, the dimension that he came from. He often said, I wrote these, I didn't write these books, Krishna wrote these books. And this is so true. This is, this is a, he didn't actually write them, you have to understand he spoke them. 
early, before he came from India, he might have written, he did. But once he was with us, he had a dictaphone from day one. And that dictaphone was his treasure. What I wanted to stress is his, uh, his Vani, his, the mystic qualities of Srila Prabhupada and the fact that what he spoke is sacred, can't be changed, can't be altered, can't be improved upon. I personally made the mistake of trying to correct him once. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, what happened was, it was very, it was with, with good intentions. But sometimes things with good intentions don't work out that way. And he was going to be speaking the Brahma Samhita, mm, the materialistic demeanor cannot possibly stretch to the transcendental, you know, you know, uh, you know what I mean, to the transcendental autocrat, that from Brahma Samhita, which his spiritual master had spoken, and which he adamantly said, don't even change a comma of that. Don't touch it, because it's called Arsha Prayog. You never touch the speech or the writings of the Acharya. It's opera. So, because he was going to be speaking this on a record album, I wanted him to put his best foot forward. I had a kind of a motherly feeling there. I did, didn't I? And um, he, pronounced, uh, he pronounced analogously, analogously. Because I typed it up, then he read it to me a couple of times to practice. We were going to record it at the studio. You remember that? Remember we went to record it? OK. So before we went, he had it written, and he read it to me, and I listened, and you know, the, you know how he's practicing. And I, finally I said, Srila Prabhupada, actually, I think that word is pronounced analogously. He flashed fire in his eyes, and he said, you pronounce it your way, and I'll pronounce it my way. And guess what? He pronounced it analogously. Anybody can listen to that record album. And that's, I think that was a British pronunciation, but I was unaware of it, perhaps. Anyway, I, um, I learned the hard way. And I think this is something that we really need to address in ISKCON now, is Srila Prabhupada's books. They have to remain as he spoke them. Because the sound vibration is sacred. And what's so miraculous, which I consider incredibly miraculous, is that within, just recently, within the last year, a 320-something page transcript that was thought to have been burned in a fire long, long ago, some 30 years ago, suddenly resurfaced. It was just lost at, at the archives. Nobody knew it was there. And it was uh, full, it's full of nectar. Uh, it was tr Rameshwar's transcript for the, uh, for the book, uh, for the Lilamrita. This is it. I had it printed out. But there are some very, very significant points about the books that, that are made. And this is long, long, you gotta realize, this is long before there was ever any kind of a BBT edit or book editing issue or any of this. None of this existed at that time. We just had Prabhupada's books. We were happy, satisfied. We had, we, there was no anticipation of this. But remember, Srila Prabhupada has mystic opulences. He could foresee all this easily. He could foresee that his books would be changed. And he also made plenty of arrangements in advance by multiple levels of instructions not to change a word. And even you can read uh, how uh, so many experiences that uh, even if a change seemed logical, Rameshwar writes in his uh, in his memoirs, even if a change seemed logical, um, Prabhupada would tell him not to change it in a way of training him not to do it. 
because Prabhupada could foresee all this. He foresaw everything. And not only that, he's still watching over this movement. I have no doubt about it. He's well aware of what's going on right now. And I see this, 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 uh, this transcript, which I recommend everyone read. There's tons of nectar about Srila Prabhupada in it. Just incredible. I recommend everyone read it. And I think that it's almost like he reached his hand out from a samadhi and said, hey, you guys, I got to remind you of a few things. I got to remind you that this is what I wanted done for my books. This is what I had in mind. And of course, Rameshwar has been gone for many years. He has no position or political. Uh, a lot of what's going on here is people are afraid to speak. But almost all of Prabhupada's disciples are in agreement that they want the original books. Almost all of them. I had no taste for Prabhupada's books, but I opened one one day and I started reading it. I said, wait a minute, I have to start all over again. I have to go back to Srimad Bhagavatam and start reading it from the first chapter. And then I realized as I was reading it that I'd never read any of these things before. So I started reading the books again, the Bhagavatam. I'm up to about the middle of the 10th canto now. And I noticed a a few weeks ago, I was about half, halfway into the first volume of it, and the tone started changing. It was like, wow, this is, there's not very many commentaries, and they, the, the flavor of Prabhupada isn't there. And then I went back to the introduction and read, well, Prabhupada passed away before he finished the 10th canto, so his students wrote the rest. And it, Prabhupada's lost. The flavor of Prabhupada was lost in, in the rest. The flavor of Prabhupada in the juice is gone. The mystic opulence. I don't know what it is, but when you read Prabhupada, his purports and, and his translations, they're different than any other writer. So I agree, you can't change these. You can't change this. Whatever he said in the beginning is, is there. I think, so far as the Krishna book is concerned, uh, there in this manuscript, this transcript, there's very explicit instructions by Srila Prabhupada about how he wanted the Krishna book printed. <coughs> and um, even though it uh, doesn't make sense to have it that size because of the cost of printing, when uh, Rameshwar tries to suggest that they make it smaller, Prabhupada practically throws him out of his room. There's a few other things like that in there. My point is that he didn't want changes to... He, he attended to every facet of his books. This is my point. An, another point is that he wanted the books, the Bhagavatams, to have about 400 pages. He actually printed those in India before he came. And it costs a lot more to do it that way. But he had in mind a very clear picture of what he wanted his books to look like. This is so important. This is something we really need to know about. And what's so remarkable is it's all delineated in this transcript. I, there were things I didn't know about. One of the things he said was that the ISKCON press is the heart of, the press is the heart of ISKCON and the art department is the heart of the press. Because the paintings, and this is something that uh, Rameshwar brought to my attention, because I'm an artist also, that the paintings are his, he said, these are our trademarks. We, we attract people by these incredible paintings that most other philosophy books are just to print. Nothing but print, right? But Prabhupada had, had all these incredible pictures put in, and he designed those pictures in detail. I know, I was an artist. He stood over my shoulder while I was doing the one for the Gita, literally telling me how to do it. And for teachings of Lord, Ch we were living in, in, in his apartment at that time. Gorsuner and I were traveling with him. And for teachings of Lord Chaitanya, 
the five p drawings that I did for that. And Gorsundar also helped me, you know, we worked together, we worked on the same picture, so, um, uh, but he, he did the composition. Prabhupada designed the composition, told us what to draw, told us how to do it, and now um, uh, people seem to think that the paintings can be changed. He made it so clear. No pictures can be taken out of my books. He said it again and again and again and again and again. And they can't be changed. Incidentally, just last week, on August 10th, 2015, Mother Govinda Dasi wrote the following on Facebook. Yes, although the books were massively edited, literally rewritten, most of Prabhupada's disciples were unaware of these changes because they all had their own books, the original editions. Up until recently, many of his disciples were unaware of this, and even now, many devotees have no idea that they are actually not reading Srila Prabhupada's books at all. In fact, they are reading, selling, and distributing Jayadvaita's BBTI version of Prabhupada's books. Anyone who takes the time to look at the differences will be shocked and appalled at the changes. I purchased a later edition Bhagavad Gita as it is from a local Krishna center. When I took it home, opened it up and began to read, I recall my first response was, What the hell happened to this book? That was my first response. It sounded nothing at all like Srila Prabhupada's writing. His writer's voice was missing. The book had been purged of the familiar sound of Srila Prabhupada's voice, leaving only a glimmer of the beauty that once was. Every author knows that he has a writer's voice, and working with an editor, there is much more taken in not losing the sound of his voice, his 